uh, to establish the same. Family, friends, activists, and attorneys spoke out, including Edgecombe's mother. My son is a very humble person, and anybody that knows him knows that this is not his character. According to the criminal complaint, in September of last year, Edgecombe was riding a bike when he came upon 54-year-old Jason Clearman and his wife in their car near Humboldt and Brady Streets. Prosecutors believe that's when there was some sort of verbal altercation and Edgecombe punched Clearman. Edgecombe's attorneys say this new surveillance video shows the Clearmans followed Edgecombe onto the Holton Street Bridge and shows Clearman got out of the car and approached Edgecombe in the moments before the shooting. Shortly after the shooting, TMJ4 News spoke to Clearman's wife. My husband got out because he just talked to the man and the guy waited for him just standing just standing there waiting. And as my husband got real close, I saw him pull out a gun. And my husband never saw it because he was close and shot him point blank in the head. And I saw my husband drop to the gun. Edgecombe's attorneys are trying to retain the same self-defense expert the attorneys for Kyle Rittenhouse used at trial. Theodore Edgecombe deserves the same right that Kyle Rittenhouse got we hope everyone continues to, uh, you know, keep a open mind and not try the case in the media and just wait till the facts uh, come about. On Tuesday, the Clearman family responded, writing in a statement, quote, Mr. Edgecombe did not act in self-defense, and this is not a close case. It goes on to say, Mr. Edgecombe acted violently first, reaching into the Clearman car and striking Jason Clearman in the face and injuring him. At the time of the shooting, Edgecombe was out on bond and was not allowed to have a gun. He was arrested about six months later in Kentucky. The Clearman family writes, This is a clear case of Theodore Edgecombe's one-sided violence, armed murder, and flight from justice. One that a controversial verdict in another county does not justify. Jury selection begins on January 3rd, and the judge says he will call a slightly bigger jury pool than normal. In Milwaukee, Stephanie Haynes, TMJ4 News. Okay, so you see what the case is about. Let, let me lay it out for you just one more time so it's, it's clear what prosecutors are alleging. And I believe a lot of this will come from the testimony of Jason Clearman's wife. She's driving the car. Jason Clearman, the man who gets shot in the face, is in the passenger seat. And apparently uh, their testimony or her testimony and the, the argument being made by the prosecution is that they're driving down the street and there is someone on a bicycle who is the defendant in this case, is riding the bike erratically. And that leads to some sort of verbal confrontation. They say it was then escalated from a verbal confrontation to a physical confrontation when the man on the bike, the defendant, Theodore Edgecombe, um, punched Jason Clearman while he was in the car. So I would presume his window was down, right? They're having this verbal um, uh, confrontation, and then he is punched in the face, and they say that Edgecombe then rode off. Now, what's not super clear at this, at this point is that as you watch the video, you see that uh, Edgecombe turns to the right down another street, and then the car also turns down the right street. Now, is the testimony going to be that she was following Edgecombe? Because, again, she's the one behind the wheel. The wife is behind the wheel. Is she going to say she was following him, or they just happened to be going in the same direction? That, I think, is not yet clear. Uh, but if you look at the video, it does look like they are following him because that is when Jason Clearman gets out of the car. He gets out of the car, starts walking, the pace picks up a little bit, and then the confrontation and the shooting occurs. You can't hear anything on the video, so there... I think you've got to rely upon the testimony of the victim's wife and perhaps the testimony of the defendant himself. If he's alleging self-defense, most of the time you usually have to testify. So that's sort of the, the groundwork for what this case and trial is going to be about. The video, extremely significant, but not the whole story for the prosecution. So... Let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining us, former DOJ senior attorney and former federal prosecutor Tammy Ellison is with us. In Cleveland, Ohio, criminal defense attorney Ian Friedman. 
And in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, trial attorney, former prosecutor Leslie Ricard Chambers. Great to see everyone tonight. Let's let's talk about self-defense and, and let's talk about, you know, we watched what happened in November. Kyle Rittenhouse video. He testified. Jury found him credible, found his story reasonable and found him not guilty. What do you see on the video? What do you see uh, in terms of what this trial is going to um how it's going to play out and, and, and how difficult will it be, one, for prosecutors to prove the case and disprove self-defense here. Tammy, I'll start with you. Thank you for having me, Vinny. I think here we see a lot of things going on, not only the similarities between what we saw in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, and yes, this is in Wisconsin again, so if perhaps Judge Schroeder or someone similar to him is going to preside over this trial, then this um, alleged defendant would be found not guilty, hopefully, with the evidence presented to the jury. But I also see comparisons with what we recently covered on Court TV with the trial of the murderers of Ahmaud Arbery, where this is a vehicle that literally is following an individual on a bicycle. A vehicle has a lot more damage that it can cause to someone and has been found in courts of laws to be viewed as a weapon. So whenever the individual gets out of the car, when the car is following him on a bicycle, I think the the defense of self-defense is going to be extremely strong, especially in the case of Wisconsin, where we now have that presidents of Kyle Rittenhouse being found not guilty. Ian, what role does the, and if the jury believes it, and I believe that's what the testimony is going to be, I don't know if the jury will believe it, but that the defendant initiates the physical confrontation by punching uh, Jason Clearman in the face before we see what happens in the video. What impact does that have on the entire scenario and the way uh, the jury may potentially see this case? So it's a good question. I think there's a lot of ingredients here. And this case really is just going to come down to the lawyering, uh, how this case is presented. Uh, because as I see it, um, you know, usually it, you, you can't incite it, right? You can't come to it and then expect to raise uh, the defense of self-defense. But here, I kind of like this fact from the defense side, because after there's this altercation, the defendant hits the deceased, now deceased, uh, and goes off. We don't know what happened exactly in that exchange. That'll come out in the trial. But he takes off on his bicycle. He's now left any confrontation. And now, after a hit didn't stop it, all of a sudden a car is coming. Who knows what's in the car? A lot of people are carrying firearms in their car. We know that. And a guy gets out of the car pursuing it. So he's got two uh, basic you know, targets coming at him. And this person is now pursuing him who was just hit. It's easy and I believe reasonable to think that the person who's now pursuing after he got, after he got hit is raising the ante here. And, and the question is, is this person now reasonably in fear for their safety? Sure, just got hit, guy gets out of the car. You know, the thing about self-defense, and I hope that the lawyers really bring this up is, and we've talked about this before, Vinny, self-defense is designed to prevent injury to oneself. And, and you know, you don't have to wait until you're hurt to exercise that right. And so when someone's coming at you, here's the lesson, don't do it. You know, if they're gonna say, oh, we were just following them, then why didn't you stay in the car? They could have called the police, and I know there's gonna be a lot of different facts come out at trial, but what we see here, part of the ingredients that I myself, while you're always concerned for the way that your clients are at trial, because you never know what happens at trial, I like these facts so far. All right, Leslie Ricard Chambers, let me throw a couple more facts into the mix here. Uh, this defendant, not permitted to have a gun because he's a convicted felon. And number two, um, different than the Kyle Rittenhouse case, where Kyle Rittenhouse, after he shoots uh, three people, hands up, walks, tries to turn himself into police. They wave him off, and then he goes to the local police a few hours later in his hometown. This guy's gone in the wind for six yeah. months. It takes him right. six months to track right. him down. Never calls police. Right. And that is problematic uh, for the defense. And I don't know how that 
those particular facts help the defense in terms of suggesting that this defendant acted in self-defense. Yes, we do have the video that shows that the uh, victim here uh, pursued the defendant. However, the other facts, as, as you just mentioned, that, that he absconded for six months after shooting him, did not go to police and say, hey, look, someone's injured, I shot someone, uh, tried to get help for this individual. All of those facts are missing. And I, and I think that they are damning for the defense. Also, I'm thinking about this in terms of just how he defended himself, the fact that he shot the victim in the head. I mean, those facts to me uh, don't play well for the defense. And so the question that the jury has to answer or have to ask themselves rather is whether or not the defendant's actions were reasonable under the circumstances. Yes, we do see the video here where the victim pursued him or at least his wife pursued him and then the victim gets out and approaches him. You don't get in you don't engage in a fist fight and then lose the fight and then decide, well, I'm going to go after the person who uh, beat me up, so to speak. And 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 so this is sort of um, the consequence of the victim's actions by, by a degree. However, the consequences that the defense uh, has to anticipate is the fact that the defendants absconded for six months, shot him in the head point blank. And so those factors are, are factors that the, that the jury are going to have to consider as to whether or not this is truly a self-defense case. All right, folks, I told you first, live trial. Court TV cameras inside the courtroom January 3rd right here on Court TV. When we come back, uh, we've got another big trial coming up in 2022 related to a really big trial from 2021. The other three officers who were there the day George Floyd died, they're going to be on trial facing as much time as Derek Chauvin. We'll take a look at that case next. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count one, unintentional second degree murder while committing a felony, find the defendant guilty. Verdict count two. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count two, third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. Same caption, verdict count three. We, the jury, in the above entitled matter as to count three, second degree manslaughter, culpable negligence, creating an unreasonable risk, find the defendant guilty. This verdict agreed to this 20th day of April, 2021, at 1.45 p.m. A, a big moment in, in 2021 here on your front row seat to Jessica. Derek, Derek Chauvin found guilty of the murder of George Floyd. But there were three other officers there that day, and they will be tried in 2022. And they're facing the same consequences for aiding and abetting. So um, is the case as strong against these three other officers. How do you prove the case against these three other officers? Um, and it all starts with what happened that day. We know it was all caught on video. Let's take a look. The plan was just to get him so he couldn't move anymore or hurt himself or hurt us. Relax. I can't breathe. You're talking. You're talking fine. Deep breath. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Ah, 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 ah. I'm about to die this day. Uh, Relax. Man, I can't breathe my face. Just get up. He's got to be on something. Uh, what, do you, what do you want? I can't breathe. Please, the knee in my dick. I can't breathe. Uh -huh. well, get up, get in the crowd, man. I will. I can't move. Ah, ah. Is, if you put a weed pipe on him, there might Mama. be something else with it. Might be like PCP or something. Is that the now communicating with them? Right, uh, to figure out if it, uh, a ambulance is on the way, and, and I asked, yeah, that's Officer Lane. Hey, just to verify, do you, do you guys have an ambulance on the way? Yes, code two, and uh, the situation where uh, the crowd was starting to kind of gather up and. Uh, uh, especially that area where hospital police and, and the way uh, Floyd is acting. Uh, I went, well, we went on the radio and told dispatch that we needed the ambulance here, code three, emergency lights and sirens. Um, 
since the ambulance is already on the way. Um, we decided to score a goal the, the, uh, the, the hobble and just hold for now since uh, if, if, we were, if we were to hobble then, uh, once the ambulance arrive, we, we would have to undo it again uh, to put him onto the stretcher. Uh, he's talking so he's fine. Uh, okay. We tried that for 10 minutes. Uh, 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 y'all know that. Uh, you don't okay. He's, uh, he's talking. Uh, he's fine. Bro, he ain't fine. Okay. All right, we're done. You, you circle. Okay, we're done. Bro. You try. You try. We're done. He's breathing right there, bro. Okay. Yeah. Shavin said, "This is. We're just gonna hold him here until EMS arrives." So and I had suggested, you know, with the excited delirium, you know, maybe we should roll him on his side. He's just 20 years on, so I, I, I mean. Basically, through the whole FTO process, you trust and go to your senior officers for experience and help on calls and what's the best thing to do in this situation. They give you direction and kind of you follow their lead. Okay, remember now there's three officers who will be on trial. Two of them are rookies, Lane and King. They are the two that are uh, also subduing uh, George Floyd, along with Derek Chauvin. Chauvin's on the back and the neck of George Floyd. Uh, you've got J. Alexander King. He's kind of on the middle. Uh, Thomas Lane, who's on the, on the legs. And then you've got Tu Tao, who never touches George Floyd. He's in charge of crowd control. Never touches George Floyd. Now, charged with aiding and abetting. Now, in Wisconsin, aiding and abetting isn't just, okay, they helped. Now, there's specific, specific you got to prove that they undertook conduct that will aid another in the execution of the crime and a conscious, a conscious desire that the conduct will yield that aid. So were they consciously trying to help Derek Chauvin kill George Floyd? I think that's what they got to prove. Let's bring in our think tank. They know a lot better than I do. Ian Friedman, I'll start with you. It, it just seems like there's an extra... An extra hurdle here for prosecutors in this one because uh, it seems that under Wisconsin law, you've got to prove in this aiding and abetting that you're taking these actions because this guy's committing a crime and I want to help him. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing because I want to make sure he can commit that crime. Yeah, under that definition, I think that Officer Tal has a lot, I should say, a lot more to work with uh, than Chauvin did and the other other two officers who were involved, who were right there on the body, saw what was going on, could hear everything. Officer Tal is going to come forward and say, look, my role was to keep the crowd back. My role, and, and we don't hear any communications from Chauvin to Tal saying, this is what I'm doing. There's nothing ev to evidence the fact that Tal is saying, I'm standing here because I want you to hurt this man. I want you to ultimately kill this man, as we know. He's going to say, look, had I not kept the crowd back, imagine what would have happened if the crowd had come in. How would those officers on the ground have responded? Perhaps many more would have been hurt, shot, whatever it is. So he's going to take on a very different role. And there's a reason why he doesn't want to be sitting at the same uh, table as the other officers, uh, certainly in the federal case with Chauvin, of course. Uh, he's just going to have to distance himself and say, look, here was my role. I'm over here. I had nothing to do with that. So that's kind of the non-legal summary of what his defense is going to be. Leslie Ricard Chambers, let me ask you about the other two. They're rookies. I mean, mm -hmm. not on the on the force a long time. Uh, Chauvin is J. Alexander King's training officer. Thomas Lane keeps saying, should we turn him over? Should we turn him over? It's I don't know if it's his fourth day, you know, on on, on the force in the in the role that he's in. So does that play a role at all, the fact that they are rookies and you've got a guy 20 years on the job, or does that not matter? I think that it could provide some level of mitigation. Um, and, and as to your point about uh, one of the rookies say, stating that he could have had excited delirium, I mean, that, that's something that they learn during their, their training. And so that's what he's thinking about, and that's what you hear him asked Chauvin about, and, and then Chauvin dismisses him. And so I think that in terms of, you know, his state of mind, uh, he, he was relying on the training, and because he was relying on the training, probably thought that 
Chauvin's actions were probably not, uh, didn't, quite, didn't quite meet the standard of the training. But I, I do believe that there's a lot less culpability there for these two rookies. Nevertheless, they, they, they were there. Uh, did they have an obligation maybe to... Oh, I think we lost Leslie's connection. So let's bring in Tammy. Tammy? Um, yes. Uh, we've heard from Jay Alexander King's, uh, one of his family members, who actually said uh, one of the reasons that Jay Alexander King became a police officer is he wanted to change policing from the inside. That was one of the reasons that he, he became a police officer. Um, he's a rookie. He, this is, you know, one of his, his, I don't know if it's his first week on the job, uh, first few days, whatever it is. Um, is, is that any part of the equation, or should this jury look at him the same way the jury looked at Derek Chauvin and get the same penalty as Derek Chauvin, which is going to be decades behind bars? <coughs> Vinny, I think that is part of the equation. It's always going to be part of the equation. Anything that the defense attorneys can present in order to get their client found not guilty based off of the evidence that the prosecution presents to the jury and based off of the evidence that the defense presents to the jury. In this case, yes, he may want to infiltrate the system, so to speak, and make changes with the inherent bias in the policies and procedures. That's something that I've done as a former uh, federal prosecutor and attorney with the Department of Justice. But at the same time, during your role as a law enforcement officer, especially in this situation, there is a duty to intervene that they were trained for. So as far as the aiding and abetting charges, I think the jury instructions are going to have to be very clear. Is it the aiding and abetting in the intentional murder of George Floyd or the aiding and abetting in the conduct of Derek Chauvin by failing to intervene when they clearly see he was excessively using force? And we already heard all of that testimony during that trial of Derek Chauvin. So I'm not sure how strong of an argument that will be, Vinny, but at the end of the day, these officers went through extensive of training, rookie or not. Yes, Derek Chauvin was their superior, but they do also have that duty to intervene. All right. Just, uh, it, it's going to be fascinating because Derek Chauvin, I think the world agreed. And, and when they saw what he did, I think there's a little bit more disagreement about the culpability or potential culpability of the other three officers involved. But as always, it will be up to a jury. And we've got a trial day. Take a look. March 2022, Minnesota versus Lane, King, and Tal, of course, right here on Court TV. Uh, when we come back, there was a big story in, in, in the news, a lot of controversy. There was a trucker, got into an accident, was criminally charged, and then was sentenced to 110 years. There was a lot of reaction, some outrage to the sentence, but the judge had no discretion. We'll give you the latest update on what happened to that truck driver, what the sentence is, and we'll let the think tank uh, examine what exactly is justice in a case like that. We'll be right back. Welcome back. There's a big, big story out in Colorado. It involves a, a, a trucker who, there was an accident Traffic was backed up, and he apparently made a series of reckless mistakes that caused his um, Reagan truck to smash into others. Four people died. He was convicted of four counts of vehicular homicide and then sentenced to 110 years. KMGH, our great affiliate out in Colorado, has more for us tonight. Outside the Jefferson County Courthouse, dozens of demonstrators stood in the cold, wearing T-shirts, holding signs, demanding a different sentence for Ojel Aguilera Medeiros. Even 20 years is ridiculous. Support, support this situation because it's an affair. 110 years in jail for a guy just in an accident. He Protesting while just steps away inside a courtroom, Judge Bruce Jones, the prosecution and defense discussed next steps to change that sentence. Cameras weren't allowed to record that hearing, but in it, questions about the legal precedent this will set. 
That's because Judge Jones couldn't find any instances in the past where the prosecution requested an expedited resentencing instead of the judge or the defense. There were also questions about whether a resentencing would prohibit Aguilera Maderos from requesting an appeal. In a press conference afterward... Y'all, this is an exceptional case and it requires an exceptional process. District Attorney Alexis King didn't take questions but spoke about why she requested that hearing. In finding its verdict, the jury recognized the extreme nature of the defendant's conduct, which warrants a prison sentence. She's working with the families of victims and has come up with a new sentencing recommendation. We will likely be recommending a sentence of between 20 to 30 years. The families of victims... Nobody wants him to spend the rest of his life in jail. ...say their voices are being drowned out from all the attention this sentence is getting. Dwayne Bailey's brother Bill was one of the four who was killed. This last two weeks, I will tell you, rivaled the initial crash as far as emotional time. He's not the victim. This crash killed four people and four good people. He agrees with the 20 to 30 year sentence and says victims spoke with the governor recently about his involvement. His message to Governor Polis... He needs to stay out of this until at least after that. And if he doesn't, I guarantee you he's bowing to political pressure. Well, we have a huge update for you tonight. The governor did intercede, as governors are permitted to do, and commuted the sentence down to 10 years, reducing that sentence by 100 years. Let's bring in our think tank. Still with me, Tammy Allison, Ian Friedman, and Leslie Ricard Chamber. Uh, Leslie, uh, your, your thoughts? I think everyone was agreeing that 110 was way too much. There's this all a lot of a lot of protesting. I get it. Five million people signed a petition. The judge was handcuffed. Uh, had to give the sentence that the, that the judge gave. Um, but now the the uh, governor has stepped in. Is this justice at this point? A uh, ten year sentence for uh, the lives of four people. You know, I don't know what was going on uh, in the governor's thought process for him to conclude that 10 years was a sufficient amount of time for this defendant to serve. But I think that this does give uh, all legislatures across the country an opportunity to think about uh, how they tie the hands of judges when they pass legislation that requires mandatory minimums on certain types of offenses. Uh, obviously, 110 years would not have served any purpose, particularly when the victims have spoken themselves to say, yes, while we want this individual to be held accountable, uh, maybe not necessary that he serve the rest of his life in jail, but yes, he should be held accountable. The 20 years, 20 to 30 years that the victim's family members were requesting does sound uh, reasonable under the circumstances. Uh, and it sounds like the state also requested that consideration as well. Uh, I, I don't know what the governor was thinking, whether or not 10 years was, was sufficient. Uh, and, and that's something that, you know, folks have to think about and then explore and maybe do some uh, inquiry as to how he got to that 10 years. Yeah, Ian Friedman, and, and you know, it, it's, it's legal. The governor is permitted to do that. We see governors a, across the country do things like this. Sometimes it doesn't happen quite as quickly as it did here. Um, do you think it was too fast? Do you think this is driven by politics? The legal process should have played out a little bit more. What are your thoughts? I don't, Vinny. Look, I, at the onset, we can all agree that this was a horrid tragedy. And we can all agree that the families uh, want justice and justice to them is prison. But not every tragedy is criminal. And the governor here, I just want to share with you a little personal experience that'll help me to answer this. I just want to give you the background. That's where I'm from, this area where it happened. And only weeks ago on Thanksgiving, I made the drive down this very pass with, with my niece and nephew. And even then we saw the trucks coming down with the, the brakes heating up. This happens all the time. And you have these emergency truck stops on the, on the sides of the road where trucks go up and the gravel's really deep to stop these trucks. He tried to get off when his brakes went, but there was a truck already blocking the way. This was an accident. The sentencing structure out there caused uh, the sentence. I get it. The jury, as juries do so often, was swayed by the fact that four people died. That's always a fear for defense counsel when there when there are, are deceased uh, involved. The emotion that detracts from the analysis of the of the facts. 
And that's what happened here. Do I think that the governor uh, acted too quickly? Absolutely not. The governor also knows the area. The governor also sees exactly what happens there. And this was an accident. Are its politics involved? Perhaps a little. And here's my personal feeling why I say that. Because 10 years is even too long when an accident should have just been considered an accident and treated as an accident. Tammy, as a former prosecutor, I have a different question for you. You can jump in on that as well, but I, I want to show you a, something that was posted on social media, unbelievably. This is uh, one of the prosecutors um, you know, in, in, in the office after winning this trial. Apparently, one of the uh, prosecutors handed this award over to another uh, prosecutor, and it's actually a brake pad. It's a brake pad. It's got the case number on it. And, and, you know, the person who gave it to one of the prosecutors, I don't know if they knew that that prosecutor was going to post it for the world to see, but um, your thoughts about that. It's been deleted since, and there's an internal investigation by the, the head prosecutor in the office, <laughs> but your thoughts yeah. about, about, really about posting it. To me, that was the biggest part of the whole thing. You know, internal, whatever you're doing with your comrades, but posting it? Vinny, you know I got a lot to say, Vinny, because not only am I a former federal prosecutor, you do know I grew up DOJ and I started my career at the office of the pardon attorney recommended in presidential pardons under Presidents Bush, Obama, and Trump. And then I was a former federal prosecutor and senior attorney with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. So as it pertains to this super early grant of clemency by the governor of Colorado, that's not normal. It doesn't happen that way typically. Typically for a pardon or a commutation, which both of those are called clemency, you know, I'm the expert, only three in the world that is in the private practice area, um, first black owned. So for clemency, typically all of the appeals and all motions are exhausted before any type of clemency is granted. And the reason why is exactly what the district attorney said in her press conference when she was discussing a possible hearing for resentencing, because she did not want to jeopardize this defendant's opportunity for appeal. So guess what? Now that this sentence has been commuted to 10 years, what is it doing? It's jeopardizing his rights to appeal. So when we're talking about this gift of the brake pad from one prosecutor to the next, and it was posted on social media, guess what? That ties right back in to what was happening during the trial. Those are things that can be brought up in an appeal. So it's very problematic, and I think that it perpetuates misconceptions uh, as it pertains to clemency. And that is something why I quit DOJ after 12 years to launch my practice in order to make people understand what clemency really is, because there are hundreds of thousands of individuals that are deserving of clemency that need to know you do not need political pressure or celebrity ties in order to get it. And yes, it is great that he received a commutation, but we have to think about what it's doing to the judicial system and his rights for appeal. Fascinating insight, folks. You're only going to get that at Court TV, and you're only going to get it from great experts like we bring on uh, each and every day and night here on your front row seat to justice. All right, Tammy Allison, Ian Friedman, Leslie Carr Chambers, staying with us. Uh, when we come back, I'll look ahead to another big trial coming up in 2022. It was supposed to happen this year. COVID shut down. It got pushed. Uh, it involves a former Playboy and Maxim model who's been charged with the murder of a doctor. That story next. Welcome back. We've got a trial uh, brewing out in Nevada. This one involves a former Playboy and Maxim model who's accused of the murder of a psychiatrist from California. Ted Rollins has the story. Renowned psychiatrist Dr. Thomas Burchard had been missing for three days when his body was found in the trunk of an abandoned BMW in the desert outside of Las Vegas. Judy Earp, his girlfriend of 17 years, was back at their home in California and sensed the doctor was in trouble. Uh, I told him 
repeatedly that these are not, you know, the people, you, the kind of people you want to be associating with. Judy was worried about this woman, 25-year-old playboy and Maxim model Kelsey Turner. Judy says Kelsey was extorting money from Dr. Burchard. About 300000 that I know about and possibly more. Burchard had a history of helping others and engaging with young, attractive girls he met online like Kelsey. That's according to his friend who did not want to be identified when he was interviewed by KSBW. These women were just like an escape for him to, to, to have somewhere to go. He told me he met Kelsey on a website and uh, met up with her and, and they talked and they went and had dinner a few times. Dr. Burchard's friend says the psychiatrist started spending time and money on Kelsey, even renting this condo in Salinas, California for Kelsey and her mother to live along with Kelsey's child. Even after Dr. Burchard stopped paying the rent and Kelsey moved to Vegas, the two did keep in contact. And shortly before the murder, Kelsey reached out to the doctor, according to his friend. He says, seems, seems that Kelsey's having some trouble with her boyfriend out there in Vegas. Um, he's hitting her, he's um, abusing her, and she has no money, nowhere to go. And I feel partly responsible for this. Court documents show that Kelsey Turner was, in fact, reported as the victim in a domestic violence case less than a month before the doctor's murder. Dr. Burchard went to Vegas to see Kelsey, calling his girlfriend Judy only after he had arrived, saying he was spending the weekend and would be back on Monday. I warned him on Saturday when he was there that, you know, maybe you ought not wait till Monday to come home. Maybe you ought to just come home on the next flight. After missing his flight and not responding to calls and texts, Judy called Las Vegas police. Dr. Burchard's body was found near Lake Mead, about 25 miles outside Vegas. The actual incident occurred at a residence in the Las Vegas Valley, and then the body was found out by the lake. This is the Las Vegas home where Kelsey and her boyfriend, John Kennison, were living and where investigators believe Dr. Burchard was murdered. Kelsey's roommate, Diana Pena, told a grand jury that Kennison attacked Dr. Burchard with a baseball bat and that after the initial attack, Kelsey insisted that her boyfriend knock him out. Pena also testified that the attack left Kennison covered in blood. According to arrest warrants, police recovered a bag from the Rio Hotel. It's where prosecutors say Turner, Kennison, and Pena fled to after the murder. Inside that bag, investigators found sheets of paper ripped from Dr. Burchard's notebook that contained his banking information and passwords. Uh, additional information has come to light. Kelsey Turner was arrested in California three weeks after police recovered Burchard's body. Her extradition was delayed after it was determined that she was pregnant. She has since given birth to a girl while in custody. Her boyfriend, John Kennison, was arrested a few weeks later in Las Vegas. Both are facing murder charges. Kelsey's roommate, Diana Pena, pleaded guilty to accessory to murder and is expected to testify at their trials. Okay, let's bring back in our think tank. Uh, Ian Friedman, uh, looking at this case for Kelsey Turner, um, does it become about domestic violence? Does it become about pointing the finger at the boyfriend? You know, this is one of those cases, Vinny, we're just going to have to wait to see how the evidence comes in because it's going to come from the testimony of Ms. Pena. We don't know what happened in the room and why it happened her just being a, a victim of domestic violence, I don't know what that's going to do necessarily to save her uh, from a murder conviction. Until we know exactly what was said in the room, uh, we're not going to have all the facts. You know, we know what happened. Uh, we know how it happened. Uh, now we just have to figure out who was the cause of it. And that's going to be sorted in the room. Uh, and we've got a lot of stuff. We've got forensics. We've got DNA. We've got cell phone records. Uh, we have his ripped up papers from his day planner in a bag at the hotel that they went to afterwards. So really all this is going to come down to is a very focused issue that's going to come from the other co-defendant, the star witness. And that is why did it happen and who exactly uh, did it? It's going to be an interesting set of facts and we're all going to learn as, as the testimony comes from the witness stand. Tammy, what is the, what is the jury going to do with the, the nature of this relationship between the doctor and Kelsey Turner? 
Vinny, I don't think the jury's going to do anything. It's normal now. It's 2022 almost. We have a couple more hours, and Cardi B has already let it be known. You know, <laughs> it ain't tricking if you got it. So let the man take care of the pretty girl. He already knows he's old, and look what he look like. He has to, you know, you got to pay some money to spend some time with somebody like that. I think that the jury is going to focus more so on the fact that, yes, she was a victim of domestic violence. Yes, that she was cohabitating with a boyfriend, and that's why her, quote-unquote, sugar daddy, you know what I'm saying, went to her rescue to see what was going on with his sugar baby, okay? The boyfriend probably needs to be looked at a little closer. I don't think the jury is going to make much of the old man paying to be around a beautiful Playboy model. That's what you you got. There's a cost, you know, to be around somebody like that. I don't think the jury is going to care. Leslie, this is a, a case. Um, I've, I've seen similar ones, actually, in Vegas in, in the past. So mm -hmm. Tammy hit the nail on the head uh, with that one. Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, there's three defendants. One of them took a deal. She's the roommate. Don't really know what motive she had to be involved with all this, but perhaps the, the common denominator to all this is that they're all uh, strung out on drugs. Does that play a role? Uh, possibly. Uh, the way I'm looking at this, though, Vinny, is, is that everybody wants a piece of the pie. The deceased boyfriend is already paying for the girl, the, the model's lifestyle, paying for her mom's, uh, residents, I believe. And, and so they all know that she's got this relationship status going on with this victim. And he's already sent thousands upon thousands of dollars to her previously. His girlfriend even knows that he spends time with this uh, young lady. I doubt very seriously if her roommate and her boyfriend didn't know the status about their relationship, the fact that he was getting all of this, she was getting all of this money. And I think that they wanted a piece of the pie. Uh, possibly, you know, he came there and they wanted him to pay for things, uh, give them some, some funds, and maybe it didn't work out. I don't know, as Ian said, what happened in that room, what, what led to this man losing his life, what led to either her, the boyfriend, or the roommates, uh, attacking him, killing him. But I believe that the common denominator here is the fact that they all wanted a piece of the pie. All right. I have a question for all three of you. You can raise your hand. Who believes that Kelsey Turner, the former Playboy model, Maxim model, will take the stand in her own defense? You know, Thanks. I don't know, Vinny. This has been a year of defendants taking the stand. So, I, look, I... I I just, it could, it's possible. It's possible. possible. Ian, any chance? We have about yeah, 10 seconds. I'm, I'm kind of going with the possible. I didn't want to put my arm up like this. I'm thinking of a way of just kind of putting it across. Not sure. The lawyers are prepping her. They'll make that decision game time. Tammy, you have eight seconds. I don't think so. You know, I think she wants to keep her secrets on how to score a sugar daddy secret. And I think that's going to come out. Tammy Allison, Ian Friedman, Leslie Ricard Chambers helping us out. The last show of 2021. We'll see a lot of you in 2022. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Vinny. Happy New Year, Vinny. Thank you. All right, folks, uh, this trial has a trial date. We've got a, a settlement.